we're very fortunate to have uh, Andrew Gilligan with us and, uh, and to have an open discussion about the events of the last while and Andrew's particular role in relation to those events. Uh, and uh, he, Andrew suggested that he's very happy to discuss any part of all that, and that's, that's fine. So feel free at the end when we, we open it up to Q&A that you can say whatever you like and uh, within reason. <laughs> And, uh, and feel free I, to, to do that. I, I thought we might start by some recounted accounts of your good self in Baghdad when you announced that the Americans had decided they had captured the airport, and they hadn't. Uh, and you reported that, and I think that caused some difficulty. Yeah, that was one of several things I did that caused difficulty. I mean, um, I, I, was, uh, I was one of three BBC correspondents in Baghdad for the duration of the war, um, or the major combat operations phase of it, and um, I uh, um, uh, quite a lot of the time, frankly, I found myself being the Baghdad traffic reporter. And I'll explain that. I, um, uh, uh, as you know, the BBC has these these manifold outlets, dozens. It sometimes seemed like absolutely hundreds, um, and um, we had to serve them all, the three of us, and. Uh, um, and I remember particularly the um, first two-way of the day, which was, uh, um, which was 7 o'clock in the morning Baghdad time, which is apparently a big listening hour on the west coast of America or something. Um, it was 8 o'clock in the evening on the west coast of America. And, um, and at that time in the morning, I was the only person up, and the generator wasn't going. There was no mains power. The generator wasn't going, and I couldn't get it going because um, it took an engineer to get it going. So we didn't have a dish. We didn't have the wires or anything like that because uh, the wires came off the dish and uh, so I had to do it on a sat phone and um, I quite often found myself on that first two-way being quite literally the Baghdad traffic reporter because there was nothing I could, like, there's nothing I knew, I just got up um, obviously I'd, I'd been through the, the nights bombing and, and actually mostly slept through it to be honest because um, I was quite tired usually and, um, uh, and, uh, and I, I literally knew nothing um, I, I couldn't check anything on the wires, I hadn't had time to go out at that point and um, I was expected to produce this kind of authoritative uh, report on what was actually happening. Um, I never said anything I didn't know, uh, but I genuinely did used to say, well, the traffic looks relatively heavy in the streets outside. <laughs> and I can, uh, uh, so that seems that they haven't been too spooked by the night's bombing, or the traffic looks mm -hmm. a bit light, maybe people are fleeing the city, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And, um, uh, um, uh, uh, and I used to pray that they would, I would come up a few minutes before the hour and I used to pray they'd let me listen to the news bulletin across the line. <laughs> now, that story I tell to illustrate the extreme information vacuum which we sometimes operated in in Baghdad, because um, we were under great restrictions as to where we could go, who we could talk to, what we could see. Um, and we, but the, the greater restriction of, uh, greatest restriction of all was the, the amount of time we had to, um, we had to spend filing and, 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 and broadcasting. And, uh, um, most times I used to get out in the afternoons because I had another reporter to share the radio with. I used to do the mornings, he used to do the afternoons, and I used to go out and actually find what was happening and, you know, report it for the Today programme the next morning. Um, and which brings me to the point of your question, which is uh, how, um, you know, how we got information out. Now, the, the vast majority of, of information that was reported about um, the progress of the war from Western sources, from CENTCOM and from the from the capitals, but, um, London and Washington, um, was in fact simply wrong, um, and uh, and and this was was a prime example. CENTCOM was claiming that uh, that the Americans had taken the airport. This was about three or four days before the statue falling, and I thought, well, look, you know, um, I wasn't, I didn't have to file. I was, it was my afternoon stint. I thought, right, let's go and see. Um, so got in the car, went out to the airport, and no Americans anywhere near that we could see. That we went up to the terminal, we spoke to the Iraqis there, there were, there were none there. I mean, there might have been some on the perimeter of the airfield. So I went back and said, look, um, you know, I've just been to the airfield, um, the airport, and, and I've been to the terminal building, I've been up the approach road, and there's no Americans there. There might be some on the perimeter. And of course, um, that, was, uh, that was terrible. I was an Iraqi propagandist, and, uh, and, I, and I'd been, you know, misleading the listeners of Britain. Um, and the world, and, and um, uh, uh, but you know, my, my experience—I have to say this—except um, 
right towards the end, when it started, when um, Mohammed Saad Al Sahab, the information minister, started to get truly ludicrous. It was the information we were getting from the Iraqis was slightly more reliable than the information we were getting. The, the information we were getting from Sencom. Mm. The problem is that um, I think that in wars, um, wars create a like uh, uh, a buyer's market in news. Um, uh, in other words, what happens is that huge numbers of, 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 of journalists uh, are sent out to, to the war zone at enormous expense, um, uh, and uh, um, also that vast screeds of, of paper are cleared for their, you know, pages and airtime are cleared for their for their efforts. So, what happens in any war is that there is an enormous increase in the demand for news. Um, but a, con a commensurate decline in the supply of reliable news. And what that does is it, is it creates a, um, a, a, a seller's market in news. Um, in other words, you can get any old crap in the paper that you might not get in a normal, uh, you know, a, a military PR can get any old crap that they might not get in a normal time. In a normal time, people would be uh, skeptical about such information coming from from uh, you know just centcom claims, but here lots of people had lots of space to fill. Uh, I'm talking about the Western press generally, not not us in Baghdad, um, and uh, and and they filled it with kind of stuff that wasn't that wasn't true and wasn't substantiated. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the one of the claims that uh, drew the attention of the government to yourself was, particularly by Adam Ingram, was the uh, description of uh, uh, the lawlessness and looting that occurred when the Americans did arrive. This is the day after the great triumph, the fall of the statue, um, which obviously they wanted, the governments of, of Britain and America wanted to enjoy their, their moment. Um, they thought, you know, we have, we've had all this hassle and now here it is, it's the end, victory, fantastic. And, and they were terribly cross with me for going on the air the next day and slightly spoiling it by saying actually Iraq is descending into anarchy. And what I said exactly was exactly that, that actually um, for the moment, I said, um, the people of, of Baghdad are living in greater fear than they were mm. under Saddam. And that was absolutely true because there was no law. There was complete lawlessness. Mm. Everything that could be um, moved was being stolen. And literally, I was broadcasting when I, I gave that two-way on virtually the only piece of electrical equipment left in Baghdad still with its original owners, because um, we had the Marines around our hotel by that stage. I mean, literally, mm. everything else, I would go out on the streets, and there was no, men there was no danger to us. Um, they were all too busy nicking stuff at that point. And, you know, they, I'd go out on the streets, and literally, the peop uh, the b some, some people had commandeered the buses. Baghdad had um, double-decker buses in those days, the legacy of the British. Um, uh, they were red as well. And, um, uh, <laughs> And, the, and, and you'd see people driving these buses sort of erratically all over the road. I hadn't got a clue how to drive buses. And they were loaded up, stuffed to the doors with, with stuff that they'd nicked. Uh, like, you know, completely ludicrous stuff sometimes that, that they couldn't possibly use. Uh, and there was this orgy of stealing. And, and no, nothing was safe. There was no power. There was no law. Everything had collapsed. And, um, and, and, and so I said, um, I said what, what the truth was, that there was anarchy in Baghdad. And of course, Adam Ingram. Um, there was a, that well-known expert on Baghdad who was obviously, you know, was actually three and a half thousand miles away at the time, um, um, begged to differ. Um, but you know, so that was that was one of the clashes I had with the government. But I had I had several I had several clashes with the Iraqis as well. They threatened to chat me out several times. For, yeah. for a similar sort of reporting or other kind. For um, for reporting that didn't accord with their view of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, I can't remember. I said something. Um, I can't remember what I said. I said something about the foreign minister. Um, I said. You know, I said the foreign minister said this, and that is clearly untrue, or something like that. They didn't, they didn't actually like that. Mm. Um, so, uh, so they threatened to chuck me out a couple of times. But actually, the great thing was I was mostly doing domestic radio, so they couldn't hear it. Um, uh, mm. You know, I, I um, uh, you know, um, that, uh, obviously there were. I think there were a couple of people at the Iraqi embassy in London. But I think they're probably too busy to listen to the Today program and feed reports back to Baghdad, even had there been any kind of working communications. Mm. So I could pretty much say what I wanted most of the time. But in February 2003, uh, Campbell released a document, uh, a dossier, to justify the invasion of Iraq. I mean, the first one. And no, that was that was the second dossier. In the second dossier, yeah, yeah. The so-called dodgy dossier. Yeah. This is this one that was copied off the internet. Exactly. <laughs> By a California graduate student. Uh, complete with spelling mistakes and grammatical mistakes. That's how. That's how. That's how bad it was. Um, mm. And the only things that were changed were bits that were changed to, in the word "sex it up" a bit. Because um, this is not the. This is not the famous sexed up dossier. This, there was two. There was one in September 2002, um, and there was another one. This one called Iraq's infrastructure of concealment and deception, or something. In um, February 2003, and it was shoved under various hacks doors on a, on a trip to. America or something by, by one of Campbell's minions. And um, 
didn't get a huge amount of coverage, but it got a lot of coverage afterwards. Mm. Um, and uh, um, it was um, it was. Uh, uh, it was basically copied, literally word for word, including the spelling mistakes and the grammatical errors from, from this PhD thesis by a 26-year-old Californian graduate student. Um, and, uh, and the only thing that was changed it was, was, was words were inserted in to make it sound more menacing. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was, you know, there, there were things like, um, that, you know, mites were changed to wills and, uh, you know, and, and coulds were changed to... <coughs> Does and things like that, and mm. and so it was. It was the same pattern we saw in the earlier dossier, of course, the September dossier. What? How would you describe the September dossier? Well, I think the September dossier hasn't really stood the test of time, has it? I mean, uh, mm. um, at the time, um, clearly we were. You know, we had a we had a little. Um, we we weren't. Uh, we were live on air when it was released. It was released at eight o'clock in the morning, and so I had to um, grab a copy and pretty much digest it very very quickly. In about fifteen minutes, I had, and. Um, and I spotted the 45-minute point straight away, and I picked up that, and I said, look, this is clearly the key point. It's meant to sort of show that Iraq was a current and serious threat, in, in the words of Tony Blair, indeed, in the foreword to that dossier. Um, and, um, uh, and then The Standard, who I now work for, of course, picked that up as well, and they had this big front page, which I now got on my wall at home, saying, 45 minutes from attack. And then The Sun had 45 minutes from doom. Um, <laughs> and, you know... <laughs> Probably the, start, the Daily Express would have had 45 minutes from you know Diana being murdered or something. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, um, there was a, there was a, there was, you know, so that that was how, and, and that that was how it played. It, it it was clearly, you see, the problem for for Blair in the um, in 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 the uh, the run up to the war. Um, this isn't generally appreciated. Most people say, oh, everyone believed Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Of course they did. I did. David Kelly did. Um, all the sources and intelligence sources I talked to did. Um, uh, that, however, was not the reason to go to war. We'd always known that, or we'd always believed we'd known that for the previous 15 years. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the reason to go to war in 2003 was that those weapons of mass destruction had become, in Blair's words, a current and serious threat to the UK. And that was the case the dossier was designed to make. Not that there were WMD. I mean, even if, even if there was no evidence that there were WMD, it was a logical inference to draw from Saddam's behavior. Why play those games with the weapons inspectors if he hadn't got anything to hide? But, they, but what nobody believed, what nobody I talked to, what Kelly, what, what people in the intelligence community did not believe, um, uh, was that those weapons constituted a current and serious threat to the West. Um, because they obviously did not. They constituted a, a serious threat to Saddam's own people, arguably perhaps to his neighbors. Um, um, you know, but, but nothing more. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, but the cost of that document was immense. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a fateful thing for Blair to do, and it was, the intelligence services were very, um, well, they were very spooked about it, actually. Um, they, were, um, uh, um, they, they were against using their product, really, in a public forum, but Blair was in such difficulty, he had to, he had to make a case, and he knew that they wouldn't believe him on his own if he said it, and, and so they, he had to sort of trundle in the... The, you know, the, the men in the you know the men in the shadows, and um, and um, a, and and you can see, and we you know I didn't know the half of it, of course, um, none of us did. Um, but it, when the Hutton inquiry came out, and then when the Butler inquiry came out, um, you could see quite how exposed that left the spooks. I mean, the, their their performance was pretty lamentable. They uh, and the Butler inquiry. I remember I, my my fav favourite bit of the Butler inquiry was at the back, the appendices. You all read documents from the back, um, and. Um, there were the appendices which detailed the, the actual original intelligence as provided by MI6 um, and, and then what it became in the dossier. Um, and the sort of caveated, cautious, and then it was turned into these bold headline grabbing judgments. We shouldn't forget that the original intelligence was also wrong. Um, mm -hmm. It was just made more wrong by the, by the government. And, uh, um, and I remember being aghast when I was reading the Butler report, genuinely aghast at how ropey the sourcing was for um, some of that uh, stuff. I mean, you know, there was a, there was, there was you know, s sort of friends of friends. Uh, there was one guy that was a th second-hand source. There's another guy who was a third-hand source. In other words, he's telling somebody who told somebody who told someone. Um, there was a, a, a guy in this, quote, circle of contacts. Um, there was another guy that was, um, that was uh, described in the Butler report as an un untried and untested source. And I thought, you know, uh, you know a spook on work experience. And, and, you know, I mean, it was a bit, I, I, say, I say sometimes, it's a bit like um, basing a case for, you know, it's basing a front page story, me basing a front page story on something that my minicab driver told me down the pub, you know, ten years ago. 
Right, except because uh, you know, obviously no, no, um, no front page story ever became the basis for killing you know, 30,000 30, to 100,000 people. No, indeed. And destroying a whole, a whole country. The entire country. The, uh, uh, the, the connections that you established with um, uh, the leading expert in Britain on biochemical warfare, how, how did that start? Well, I knew him from, um, uh, uh, God, I'd known him for about two years, three years maybe. I can't remember exactly how long now. Um, and I'd met him several times before. He'd given me information about um, weapons programs and things which had been reliable in the past. He was, uh, he was all very helpful to journalists. Um, he was uh, um, extremely knowledgeable. Um, and actually, in retrospect, we can, we, can, we, can piece, we can paint in some of the background. I didn't know at the time, um, but he, he clearly did feel undervalued, and rightly so. Um, you know, I mean, he, he, his feelings were right. Um, he, uh, um, he obviously met rather a lot of journalists. I never knew how many other journalists he was meeting, but he, he, you know, he was, that list he was asked to compile was quite a lot, um, quite long, um, mm -hmm. and included, I think, three other journalists from the BBC alone. So you weren't guilty of tricking him into discussions? <laughs> no, he was quite happy to talk, and uh, always was. And um, uh, you know, I mean, he knew he knew it would be used. We discussed how it would be used, how how his um, identity would be portrayed um, in the piece. Um, he agreed the quotes. Um, he was, uh, um, you know, he was he was au fait with that kind of thing. Unfortunately, you know, when it ran out of so sort of horribly out of control, um, then that's when you know that's when. Um, uh, that's when, frankly, um, the, the ground started to move under all our feet. Mm. How would you characterize all that now? Well, I mean, I, I've never disguised, I've never denied that I made some mistakes in the reporting of what he said. Um, he didn't say, I mean, the famous, the famous uh, first two-way, 6.07 two-way, seven minutes past six in the morning, um, to an audience of about 40,000 sheep farmers, um, <laughs> was... Uh, was a mistake. I mean, I said something like, I can't remember exactly what I said now. Um, it used to be absolutely etched into my mind. Um, but I said something like, the, the government probably knew the 45-minute figure was wrong even before they put it in the dossier. Well, he hadn't said that. I think they probably did know. In fact, I'm certain they knew. We know now, for instance, that they knew the 45-minute figure only referred to, uh, to battlefield nuclear weapons, which were not anything that could threaten UK or, or British bases on Cyprus or any of the other stuff they said. So, um, so they probably, you know, they did know it was wrong. However, um, I hadn't been told that by David Kelly. He hadn't quite said that. Um, now, in subsequent two ways, I never went back to that. Um, but, uh, and I used the form of words I'd agreed with him. But, uh, but that one, that first one was wrong. However, it wasn't dramatically wrong. And it, uh, um, and it, it really became, I think, probably the most over-analyzed, ridiculously over-analyzed sentence in, in British broadcasting history. Mm. Um, and in no way was it a sufficiently serious mistake to have the consequences for the BBC that it did. Mm. No, no, indeed. Uh, there's certainly a case to be made. The, the, the drama, of course, portrayed in the States and in Canada was that um, in the midst of justifying a war which would have this cataclysmic social effect and kill so many thousands and tens of thousands or more people, uh, what you, mistakes, any mistakes you made were relatively Small. Yeah, I thought so. Um, I'm sadly, sure the, uh, did, but the judge disagreed. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, that was the whole madness of it. And it, I mean, mm. um, h here we were. We had a war. You know, f firstly, we had we had we had a war in which thousands and thousands of people had died, and and actually, they were having an inquiry into a, into a, into a story by a hack, um, and um, uh, and and unfortunately, I mean, the, I think the government was the government was extremely clever in one way and extremely stupid in another. They they did pick the right judge in, in, in their terms. They picked the judge who would give them the verdict they needed. Um, and they picked the terms of reference carefully. And actually, if you think about it, um, it's, quite, it, it's quite wrong that one of the parties being inquired into is allowed to choose, choose their judge and allowed to set the terms of reference of the inquiry. But that's the way it worked. And we're all too shell-shocked after, after the, you know, in the immediate aftermath of David Kelly's death to object to it. Mm. And, um, and I must admit, I genuinely did, did think that um, we didn't know much about Hutton. I didn't even know how to spell his name for the first day. I thought it was called Lord Utton, uh, with a with a U. Um, uh, and um, uh, and we thought, you know, actually, this is a judge. Um, it might be fair. It, you know, it, it'll be judicious at least. It'll be. Uh, it, it'll consider the evidence. It'll have regard to the law. And of course, unfortunately, it did none of those things. So the end, in the end, 
the government chose too well because Hutton over delivered. And I, um, I, I do say that if Campbell had been written, had written that report himself, he'd have made it 10% more critical of him to give mm. it a bit more credibility. Mm. Um, and so, luckily, I mean, uh, it was so bad it was good. Um, it was, it was almost immediately discredited, not quite discredited quickly enough to save my job and Greg Dyke's job, but you know, it was discredited pretty quickly and, and, and it didn't, you know, so it didn't have any long lasting impact, I don't think, on the reputation of the BBC or on, or on my reputation. So I think a lot of people in the BBC were very unhappy at all the grief you've seen oh, yeah. across. Oh God, yeah. I mean, well, the BBC. I mean, the BBC is a funny organisation. I mean, um, it is, of course, a state broadcaster, um, and uh, and it is, um, it's got some fantastic journalists, some really good journalists. Um, it's also got a minority of distinctly average journalists who um, who uh, who um, who see their job as simply. Uh, going to press conferences and reporting what is said at those press conferences or reporting what is said in other, other such forums and who, who deeply dislike original um, story getting muckraking journalism mm. um, because it, uh, you know, it doesn't, it, they, they genuinely feel it, it's, not the, it's not the BBC's remit. So I remember um, I, I had a particular, there was a, there was a guy called Mark Leighty who was the defence correspondent when I arrived in 1999 and of course he was deeply unhappy anyway at the fact that today had taken on somebody like me, somebody like me because I was a defense expert as well and 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 then you know he, he wouldn't get those all important two ways on today anymore I do them so he was unhappy about that but he was also unhappy about my very approach to story making and I did a story uh, fairly early on at today in which I used the phrase in the in the report the BBC has learned and he rang me up and said the BBC does not learn you know and and I, said, you know, <laughs> and I thought yeah well and, and and then later actually in the end went off to be a PR for NATO which I thought was his <laughs> uh, he turned up in Macedonia when I was on a story and um, and he very quickly became known as the mission creep um, and, and he always thought to his dying day, he thought I coined that nickname for him, and I didn't actually. And, but I was, you know, I was perfectly content for it to be known that it to be thought that I had. But it was somebody else. It was one of his, one of his BBC colleagues. But um, so there were people like that, and there were other people who were, um, you know, who, who just wanted a quiet life, and, and who, um, I mean, the BBC's. Uh, um, you know, the BBC is a very cautious organisation journalistically, and that's absolutely right. I absolutely agree with that. It's, it's, you know, its reputation for accuracy is is its most important, um, its most important asset. Uh, and and there were some people who genuinely thought, and uh, you know, uh, and although I had nothing but contempt for people like later, I respected these other people. I thought some people who genuinely thought it wasn't in the BBC's business to go and do risky journalism um, that might that you know that might not turn out to be a hundred percent. Right, because you know what it's like when you're doing um, that kind of journalism. You do, um, I inevitably, what you're doing, you're shining a torch in a darkened cupboard, um, and, uh, and some parts of the cupboard are concealed from you. Uh, so, so that kind of journalism is always going to be more risky than going to press conferences and reporting what is said at those press conferences. But so, so there were, always were people at the BBC who were sceptical about the kind of journalism I did, and some of those people were pleased um, when, when, uh, when, when I got into trouble. Mm, I'm sure, but the, in Hutton, the, there was a question you raised subsequently that Scarlett and others were not allowed to testify. I think Scarlett was, no, I mean, Scarlett testified, didn't he? I think he did, yes, he did. He did it perhaps in the end, but there was a complaint that he hadn't been for, us for a while. What, were there others that you felt that should have? Well, I mean, are, are you, are, well, um, John Scarlett, the, the uh, mm. head of um, the um, Joint Intelligence right. Committee, I mean, there were various people in the BBC. I thought Kevin Marsh, my editor, was described to me by my uh, barrister, Heather Mills, as the luckiest man in the world, not having to testify. And Lord Hutton's sort of matchless lack of understanding of, of how journalism worked here, I think he actually thought Greg Dyke was the editor of the Today programme. And when Greg Dyke said, when Greg Dyke said words to the effect that he didn't actually monitor the day-to-day -day output of the of, of the programmes, um, uh, I think that really was what damned the BBC in Hutton's eyes, because he, he didn't he had complete lack of understanding of how the how, how journalism worked, um, and a complete lack of understanding of how the BBC worked. And obviously, for every every hour of the day, I think there was something like 20 hours of output in all on all the BBC's various services, and um, and nobody. Uh, not even as anyone as superhuman as Greg Dyke can do, uh, listen to all that stuff. Um, um, so, so actually, that the the people who were actually responsible for for uh, editing the Today program never testified at the Hutton inquiry. My editor, um, the, the 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 editor on the day, Miranda Holt, um, a, a, and you know it was basically me. And then they went right up the chain to Richard Sandbrook, the head of news, and Greg Dyke, the head of the BBC itself. Um, and and that was um, a shame because. Uh, 
after I left, the BBC, in a, in a very classic bureaucratic fashion, um, basically laid all the blame for everything that had gone wrong on the most junior person, namely myself. They had, a, they had an inquiry uh, which blamed me for everything, as if I'd somehow rushed into the studio and got myself on air at gunpoint. You know? um, and uh, and, and I, I did have to point out at the time that, um, that actually, uh, you know, this story got on air as a result of an editorial process. I pitched it to the day editor, who then pitched it to Kevin, um, who then said, that sounds like a good story. In fact, I've been told something very similar myself by Claire Short, and also, uh, I later learned, by the head of MI6, um, who we'd had lunch with the week before, um, uh, and let's put it on the air. And, you know, they knew exactly what the sourcing was. They knew exactly what I was proposing to say. Um, but, of course, they, they ran away from it when, when the going got, got tricky. Although, I have to say, Greg and Richard Sandbrook and Mark Damazer, um, the, the, the three top people involved were staunch throughout. It was the people um, in the middle. It was the it was the it was the editor of the program who was who was um, mm. who was who was tricky and unreliable. Mm. But in the course of Hutton, you sent it in email, a famous email. I sent an email. Um, no, it wasn't in the course of Hutton. It was before um, the uh, the inquiry. It was before Kelly's death. Mm. He was giving evidence to the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. You remember and. Uh, and I'd previously, I'd, I'd sent an email to one of the members of that committee, David Chidgy, lived MMP, um, uh, suggesting that they ask him about uh, some comments attributed to a source on Newsnight. Because uh, actually what had happened a couple of days, maybe a day after my original story, Newsnight had done a story saying very much the same thing. And, uh, and I didn't know who the source was. And, uh, uh, but, it, you know, it sounded... Um, it sounded very similar to the sort of things David Kelly had been saying to me. So I suggested they, I suggested to Chizzy he asked Kelly about that, and um, that was a pretty serious mistake. Uh, but I didn't actually. I mean, the, mytho the mythology has grown up that um, I gave away Kelly as my source to Chizzy. I did not. I didn't say he was my source. I didn't even say he was Susan Watts' source, the, the Newsnight reporter. I, ju I just suggested he be asked about it. But it clearly put him under extra pressure, so it was, it was the kind of thing you do when you're um, under a huge amount of pressure, and it was, it, was, uh, it was wrong. What sort of pressure, how would you describe that pressure? Well, it was like nothing I'd ever, I'd ever known before, and I, you know, I was plenty used to pressure. I'd done, you know, been through the war, I'd been through a couple of other war-like things, and um, I'd been on, the, you know, on, a, on a big news program. And, uh, um, but this was you know, really amazing. I mean, uh, I remember when the... When, when Campbell decided to, uh, I mean, what, what's generally forgotten again, I mean, there's a huge amount of, um, of, of, of looking at history in hindsight, rewriting history in hindsight here. And, and actually, one of the things that, um, that made us so sure we had to stick with the story was that, um, was that the government actually didn't get cross, they didn't decide to get cross about it until a month afterwards. Mm. Now, it could have been this great calumny. Um, you know, as if accusing a politician of lying is in, 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 is in any case, you know, a great calumny. But, you know, I mean, it's a 5p coin of political debate. It's, you know, it's, it's made about 30 times a day on every TV programme in, in Britain. But, um, mm -hmm. but, but nonetheless, even if, had it been this great calumny, we'd have expected to have outrage complaints right away. We didn't. We had a complaint from Anne Sheebus, a Down, Downing Street press officer, but they complained about everything in a very routine way on the Today programme, literally everything. Um, and... Um, and it wasn't in any way out of the ordinary run of things. Um, so, so it was only a month later when Campbell was in a, in a spot on the Foreign Affairs Committee, because if you remember the Foreign Affairs Committee were having an inquiry into this story, and they'd spoken to me, and then they spoke to Campbell. And um, Campbell was in a bit of a spot, and, and so he decided, I think, again, very cleverly, tactically, to make it a story about the BBC rather than about the government, and it was brilliant. So he launched this huge attack on the BBC. In, other, in his words, in his diaries, he, he opened a flank on the BBC. Um, you know, a flank is a diversionary attack. And, uh, and, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and every time he was asked an awkward question about the dossier, he simply turned it, the answer into a massive attack on me and on the, on, on the corporation. And, and he, he made a very broad-ranging attack. It wasn't just on, on my story, actually. It was on the entire corporation's Iraq coverage and, indeed, the BBC as a whole. And... Uh, um, uh, and so that, and, and that was on the 25th of June, I think, which is nearly a month after the story on the 29th of May. And uh, so, so the fact that they'd only gone ballistic a month afterwards was one of the reasons that persuaded us that, that, that they were lying, that, um, that, that uh, this was just a political tactic, a political game, made us even more determined to defend the story. And we knew, of course, as well by that stage. Um, We'd had other, the original story was a single source story, but we had lots of other sources coming forward 
since that time to back it up, including, mm. I might add, some of the people who subsequently gave evidence against us at the Hutton Inquiry. Could you detail that? No. Okay. <laughs> Two years later, a drama appeared <clears throat> in which you appeared as a, a, ver a despicable figure. Um, I think you were described by one critic as a uh, sweaty, treacherous villain. That's right. <laughs> oh, which I thought was pretty good. And, uh, uh, and, but who also said in the, in the course of the same review that you were subject to the same embroidery and distortion that you were accused of. Uh, and uh, it struck me as astonishing. I couldn't remember a case where a journalist, in a way, was portrayed in this way before there was any evidence to suggest. Yeah that, for example, one of the charges made in the film against you was that you electronically altered evidence uh, to uh, make identical two particular briefs that you prepared. Could you tell us about how that happened this and, what, was, and uh, what the evidence yeah. that they had claimed to have was? This is a Peter Kosminski um, docudrama. Um, now, Kosminski is one of these people, there's quite a lot of them in the media actually, who have quite a high reputation, but who is actually a complete charlatan. Um, and uh, um, he, he claims um, to have conducted painstaking research um, into all this. Um, and uh, um, I later learned that his painstaking research was hiring a man who was employed by the MOD to go over the, um, the public records of, of the Hunt Inquiry. Um, and I did have to point out to the Kosminski Inquiry as patiently as I could that actually my actual organizer, the, the allegation was that I'd altered, um, that I took, I took notes of my conversation with David Kelly on an electronic organizer, which I still have actually, and, um, uh, and the allegation was I'd gone back afterwards and altered, altered those notes. Um, and uh, the Hutton Inquiry was naturally interested in this um, and, uh, and went into it very thoroughly. And they hired uh, a forensic electronics expert to examine the organizer. And also we, the BBC, we hired our own forensic electronics expert to examine the organiser, just to make sure that you know um, it was being done properly. And uh, both of them looked at it at length for literally weeks, literally weeks, and con and you know concluded there was nothing amiss. They found no evidence of tampering um, because there was none. And um, uh, and and for that, you know, and that that process has gone into a very in a very thorough way. And I said that to Kosminski, and I said, look, you know, the inquiry. Um, the inquiry may have had a go at me in other respects, but not in this. And um, and uh, uh, and unfortunately, the trouble was. Imagine this: you're, you're Peter Kosminski. You've um, you've been given a large amount of the advertisers' money, Channel 4's money, to uh, make a, uh, a revelatory docudrama that's going to add to people's understanding about the Hutton inquiry and and the whole David Kelly business. And and actually, you haven't come up with anything very very new. So you've just got to you've got to make it up, which is what he did. Um, and I, I wrote them a very long letter in which I went in exhaustive detail into the findings of the experts in the Hunt Inquiry. Um, and, uh, and, and they basically ignored it, and they knew. They knew I wouldn't sue them because, A, I haven't got any money. Um, well, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, yeah. because the inevitable, this is the most damning a complaint well, made against you, see, you in thing many is, ways. It wasn't that damning. Well, it wasn't that damning. I mean, if it had started to get real traction, then I might have had to. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, it got hardly any coverage. It was clearly intended to be Kosminski's great publicity exercise that would, you know, propel the story into a new stratosphere. And and, um, and and I think it got it did get some coverage in the Guardian, but I think I don't think any of the other papers even touched it. And uh, um, uh, because it didn't have any credibility, uh, because you know everyone who, everyone had been through this at the inquiry, and you know they 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 they'd been around this course at the inquiry. They'd covered the testimony. The ex both the experts gave. You know, oral testament at the inquiry, and I also had to give oral testimony about my uh, about my uh, organiser, and um, uh, and so you know, the, the general verdict was this was not true, it was not credible, uh, and I said, and you know, the, the trouble was, I, I I do I did feel that Kosminski uh, was the the most egregious example, if you like, but by no means the only example of a of something which um, which which struck me throughout the whole business that actually. Um, in, you know, in order to condemn me, that uh, I was struck by how far my journalistic critics had to distort what I'd done in order to condemn me, um, and uh, and it was very sobering, very sobering seeing journalism from from both ends mm. um, being the reported on, uh, um, as well as the reporter. But um, you know, Kosmis I mean, Kosminski, um, I mean, Kosminski's program was uh, was. Was, was not very good, I don't think, in all sorts of other ways. It made other things up as well. I remember there was a sequence in which 
uh, uh, sexy MI6 agent showed David Kelly some plans of a weapons facility in a Baghdad hotel room. Now, you know, the idea they bring these plans into Baghdad and show them in a, in, you know, I mean, it's ludicrous. And then this same woman, um, this, uh, then an Iraqi agent um, came, out, came out of the war afterwards and was wandering around London and met up with, with Kelly and said, you know, you've been conned. And the idea that even MI6 would allow uh, a senior member of Iraqi, Iraq's weapons program to wander around London two weeks after the end of the war is, is pretty implausible. So it was, you know, it didn't do, it didn't do any great damage. We've covered a lot of the, a, a lot of the charges that have been made against yourself and, uh, and the general circumstances. Are there any thoughts you had about how you conducted your own defense in that period? Well, I, I must admit, I, I, I came out afterwards wondering if we'd, um, if we, you know, done it in the most effective way. The BBC's, um, the BBC's broad strategy was right. I think it was to admit. Errors and, and to be honest, you know, about our failings. And um, I was absolutely happy about that because I thought it's firstly the right thing to do, and secondly, um, you know, we might get some mercy from the judge. Uh, that was wrong, obviously, but um, you know, it was a gamble worth taking. Um, and uh, um, and actually, it did. It, it did. It did. Um, it, it, it was. It did work better, I think, than the approach the government took, which is sim quite simply to deny everything, pretend all was well. Mm. Because he, he, although the judge bought that um, very largely, uh, the public didn't. And the great thing about the inquiry is it was, it was all public. Uh, all the evidence was printed on the web. Um, it was extensively reported in the newspapers. And, and the British people had been able to read and write for a long time. And, um, and they could see this stuff. Uh, and they could make up their own minds. And they'd all made up their minds. Um, Fairly early on, um, I think probably the turning point in the inquiry was when the was when the Britain's second uh, most important um, chemical weapons expert, after David Kelly, a man called Brian Jones, who was the head of the uh, Defence Intelligence Staff's section dealing with weapons of mass destruction, is when he gave evidence saying that the dossier had been he didn't use the word sex stuff he said it had been um, over eggs, um, which amounted to the same thing. And I think mm -hmm. that that was that was the evidence that 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 struck home with people and and the kind of evasions of, of Jeff Hoon and people like that in the witness box were, were very widely reported. I mean, we had it, you know, I mean, w one of the things that did strike me at, it, it was how sobering an experience it was to be on the receiving end. Um, and I do feel a tiny bit sorry for Campbell. I mean, not that sorry. I mean, I don't want to get run away here. I mean, um, <laughs> I mean, I had it for six months and I could see how it kind of twisted people and sort of bent them out of shape because you're always defensive, you're always thinking, God, you know, how can they use this against me? I, you know, c can I say this to this person? And I stopped talking to lots of people. But a lot of my friends are journalists. I stopped talking to all but my closest friends because I didn't know whether it would end up in the papers. And, um, and, uh, um, and, and so I could see how it kind of, you know, it made, made people go slightly mad. And I only had it for six months and Campbell had it for ten years. So I, no wonder he was so loopy by the end. And, and he was almost a tragic figure, I think, because he, he, um, it's a, you know, it, it, I said he was. I said it was tactically brilliant what he did, and of course it was because it, it made the story about the BBC for the for the for the you know for the while well, it lasted rather than the rather than the war and, and the government. Um, but of course, strategically, uh, like most things he did, um, he was complete a complete disaster because actually, if this whole episode was intended to um, to disprove my story about the dossier and restore faith in Tony Blair. Um, it simply could not have been more counterproductive. Mm. And I remember, think, I remember seeing, even in my you know, misery, um, uh, in the immediate de aftermath of the Hunt report, um, I remember seeing Campbell doing that press conference of the Foreign P Press Association, that big one, we had that big staircase in the background. Um, and just all he needed was the banners. Um, and, um, and, 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 he, and he was going there, he was completely um, merciless. And I thought, this is going to play really badly with the public, Ali. Um, you know, you have just fucked yourself, and, and actually he had, um, and 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 you could see, and and, and I, I know this. I mean, a lot of my government contacts said they were they were you know they were gnashing their teeth at the way Campbell had kind of snatched defeat from the jaws of victory with that stupid press conference, that triumphalist press conference, and um, and it just added to the whole public impression that the whole thing was a whitewash, and uh, um, uh, and so again, uh, you know, really it was so bad it was good. Mm. But in terms of Dr. Kelly's family, however, there was. Uh, the uh, the uh, that's a story that hasn't kind of resolved itself. Mm. And what's what's your reaction then to uh, to their re reaction to you? Well, they were um, actually um, all right to me, to be honest. Um, uh, I mean, they gave evidence, as you know. The only time 
any of, of David Kelly's family have spoken in public was at the Hunt inquiry. Both his his wife and his sister, uh, his, his daughter rather, gave evidence. Um, and uh, and in that evidence, they made it absolutely clear who they blamed for their mm. husband and father's death. Uh, it wasn't me, and it wasn't the BBC. We were barely even mentioned. And uh, uh, I mean, in Mrs. Kelly's words, David felt betrayed by the government. They had. Um, he had gone forward to them voluntarily. I still don't know why. I think it's one of the great mysteries why he actually gave himself up. I think he was, I think he, he'd confided, he'd spoken to me to a colleague, and I think he was worried the colleague would grass him up, but uh, that's only a theory. Um, and, uh, but he, he, he went forward and he did so on the basis of a promise that his identity would be kept confidential, mm. um, that, uh, that he wouldn't be you know, subjected to disciplinary action, and, um, and, and that you know, his, his status would be respected. And of course, uh, um, what happened? Um, they couldn't resist it. Um, in their the, the battle with the BBC was raging by that point, and um, and they played this extraordinary game with the press um, in order to get his name out into the public domain. I mean, Campbell, as we now know from the Hunt inquiry, discussed actually simply releasing David Kelly's name to uh, his favourite journalist, a man called Tom Baldwin at the Times. Um, and when that was vetoed, um, what they did, they uh, they they issued enough clues. Um, so that journalists could work out who it was. And, and, and they said to the MOD press office, the Ministry of Defence press office, um, just confirm the name if somebody gives it to you. And I know somebody from the Times actually did give them 25 names before they confirmed the right one. Now, that is unprecedented behaviour from the Ministry of Defence. They've got loads of ways of not confirming something if they wanted to. Um, and they, they wanted the source out. Campbell indeed said, um, we wanted the source out in his diaries. And they got the source out. And the source died as a result. But Blair claimed, of course, that he had nothing to do with any of this. Well, um, that was a um, that that was clearly untrue, and, and was shown to be so by the by the papers um, it released the Hutton inquiry. And for a long time, that caused people a lot of excitement. And so, you know, how Blair cannot get away from the fact that he lied on board that plane. Remember, it was a mm -hmm. press conference I think he gave on board his plane to Japan. Um, and, and luckily he could, because Hutton redefined the terms of his, ter his terms of reference to make sure he didn't actually have to cover that bit. Um, so he didn't have to give a verdict on it. So he didn't have to say Blair had, had lied about not being involved in the release of Kelly's name. Of course Blair was involved. Um, we, all, we all knew that. Um, and, and, you know, the, the other thing I, that didn't really come out sufficiently, I think, in the inquiry, it's, it's there in the documents if you want to look. But, um, uh, and this is where I do think we could have made a better fist of it. I, th I, I think we should have made a little bit more, we, we should have admitted our mistakes, as we did, um, but we should have been a little bit more um, forward about what we got right, and we should have been more forward about what the government had done. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that I spotted in the documents, and didn't really get referred to much in the evidence, was the way the government actively pushed the Foreign Affairs Committee and actively pushed the Intelligence and Security Committee to interview this guy, David Kelly. They didn't want to. The clerk, there's, a, there's an email from the clerk of the committee saying, I don't think we're interested in this. This isn't the basic, this isn't the basic, um, you know, con um, this isn't the basic subject. I mean, actually, the inquiry, if you remember, had concluded by then. They had to reopen it mm. to interview David Kelly. And, uh, and they were reluctant to. And, uh, and the government pushed and pushed and pushed until eventually they, they did reopen the inquiry with the results we all know. Um, so I think um, no, I, I think the government I think that, I think that um, um, Miss, Mrs. Kelly and, and, and his daughter were quite right. Um, the government was far more culpable in his death than we were. Mm. I think we can open up for questions. But, I mean, you can talk about other stuff if you want, like you know my award-winning campaign against King Livingston. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what, you know, the, the, the good things as well as the bad things. Okay, Gavin. <laughs> 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 We're open for anyway. questions. You wait for the microphone, if you would, please. There we go, right in the front. My name's Tim Ness. Just to pick on that, off on that last point, who will you be voting for on May the 1st? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I've got a great, a lot of time for Ken. He's, you know, honest, um, <laughs> pleasant, kind, um, thoughtful. Um, it, it will not be Ken. Uh, it probably will be Boris, actually. I probably am going to vote for Boris. Um, uh, I, because I think, Realistically, nobody else can beat Ken. I'm not, not, not because I'm a vast, certainly not because I'm a Tory. Uh, I'm absolutely not. Um, uh, it's not because I'm a vast fan of Boris's. Well, they do believe he'd be an infinitely better man than Ken. It's just that I, I do believe, excuse me, 
Excuse me. Even the mention of him brings me out in sneezing. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I do believe he, I do believe Ken is unfit to be there. Uh, so it's, it's you know it's incumbent on. Well, I I think uh, firstly his um, uh, the key the key charge against him is that he is a fraud essentially. Um, he paints himself as this highly competent, um, highly successful mayor. And actually, he's done one good thing, which was the congestion charge. Um, and that was a pretty long time ago now, five years ago, and has largely also stopped working. Congestion in central London is pretty much back where it was before the charge came in. But virtually everything else he claims, you look at the figures, you, look, you, you burrow down deep. Um, if you take him at his own fa face value, he has been successful. But if you look at the actual um, evidence that really happened, um, as compared with names, they're all lies. Um, he claims, for instance, a you know, very, very random example. He's always talking about this 50% target for affordable housing and uh, that 50% of all new housing should be affordable in London. And actually, um, he spent fortunes on it um, and, uh, and constantly claims terrific success. Well, I, I actually went back and looked at the percentage of new build housing that was affordable in, in 2000 when he came to office, it's 34%. And actually looked at the percentage of the new build housing that's affordable when he, um, uh, last year, and it's 34%. So it's exactly the same as it was. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, there are lots of things like that. and, and um, it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the lots, of, lots of other things I could bore you by going into in great detail. I'm not going to. But uh, uh, so there's that. Firstly, he's fundamentally dishonest. Um, and secondly, I, 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 think he's, I think he's got fundamentally the wrong approach to, um, to running London, which is to, is to divide people up into kind of artificial interest groups based on often quite random things, like their race. Um, now, I mean, if you... Um, you know, you, um, uh, if you're a Muslim, for instance, that is your identity as far as Ken is concerned. And he doesn't seem to realize that actually people have plural identities. Some Muslims might want to define themselves as not just a Muslim, but maybe a socialist or a Millwall supporter or a, um, you know, a lawyer or a, or, a, or a vegetarian or something like that. But to Ken, you're just a Muslim and you get a clunky pitch on Palestine and, um, and, and uh, the Islamophobia of Boris Johnson. And, and there's a whole series, there's rather a good piece in the Telegraph today by Ian Martin actually, um, which, which, which he, he's created a whole series of client groups um, which, which he wants to try and put under his control um, and, and that's what Lee Jasper was all about, it was about parceling out money, um, this is the advisor that had to resign after some stories I did, um, uh, um, it was about passing out money to various client groups so he could basically buy votes in the kind of very kind of 1970s New York Democratic Mayor style uh, of politics, and, and, I, and I, I hated that. I think it's it's important to see people for what they are, and not you know, and, and, and not the kind of you know divide them into artificial groups. Yeah. Over here, in the back. Okay. My name is Valerie Tort, and as an ex BBC employee, I would like to ask you: Have you ever felt, or do you ever feel guilty or uneasy? about what the BBC had to go through, or we all in the BBC had to go through, and, and the fact that, it, as you mentioned, uh, it meant that Greg Dyke had to leave. And I, I think, all in all, it, it caused a great damage to the BBC and, and a lot of attacks from other people. Um, the answer is no, because um, it very largely wasn't my fault. I accept some of the responsibility, um, but it was very largely the fault of, of two people, uh, or, or, two, or of two bodies. Um, the government, which launched this wholly unjustified attack on a story that was almost entirely true um, to divert attention from its own failings. And secondly, um, it, it, uh, the, the BBC governors who essentially panicked um, uh, had they that, and, and, sacked, and sacked Greg. And I, kn I know, um, uh, um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I know Greg certainly doesn't hold anything against me. We've had, um, we've had, we've met several times since um, and uh, he's made that clear. Um, I, I think um, uh, I, I think it did show up some real sort of institutional weaknesses in the governance of the BBC. It showed up the fact that that actually, um, you know, you had the greatest broadcasting organisation in the world run by a, a fairly third-rate group of people, the governors, who who, um, who really should have waited just if they waited just 48 hours longer, they would have seen the backlash um, building up, and they would have uh, and it would have it would have settled down and. and uh, and maybe we could have um, we could have carried on. Um, maybe we couldn't have actually. Maybe it would have been too difficult. 
Um, maybe it was best it was a clean break, but, uh, but, but ultimately it was the governors that panicked and turned um, what was a relatively minor mistake into, a, into an enormous crisis for the organisation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, you lost your job. Greg Dyke lost his job. Um, Alistair Campbell lost his marbles. David Kelly lost his life. Tony Blair has become the peace envoy for the part of the world where he contributed to a war. What do you think about that? Well, I, I mean, I can't feel any great hatred towards Blair. I really can't. I mean, uh, I do think, actually, genuinely do think that Blair and Campbell have been, they may have avoided kind of formal judicial punishment that they probably both deserved. Um, it would have been nice, of course, to see, you know, Blair in handcuffs in the, in the hay, but it was never going to happen. Um, <laughs> uh, but actually, they, were, they, have, they have been given life sentences in the court of public opinion, which is actually far worse. Um, and um, if they had actually just owned up to their mistakes and not tried to kind of absurdly force this through um, and, and, and made the kind of absurd um, defense of them that they did in the, in, uh, the thing, w in, in the episodes that led to the Hutton Inquiry, then, then they, wouldn't be, they wouldn't have been in so much trouble. Uh, and if at any point during the Hutton Inquiry they'd actually held up their hands and said, you know, I don't think we did get everything right, the public might have been more forgiving. And, uh, um, uh, um, I mean, you know, Blair was, uh, it, it's arguable that that it's certainly, Iraq was certainly the turning point for Blair's premiership, and it's arguable that this story was the turning point in Iraq. Um, and uh, it was never glad, confident morning again for Blair after that, with a very brief interlude around 7-7 and the, and the winning of the Olympics. Um, but uh, but uh, apart from that, it was downhill all the way after that. So he has, I think, been adequately punished. And Campbell, you know, Campbell, as I say, I do think Campbell is a sad figure. I mean, he hasn't worked since since leaving Downing Street, he's just running marathons and, and you know, and, and signing, signing, doing book launches. And, and he, he, he just, and he's still, I mean, every time he, he has a, every time he appears on some public platform, he still has a go at me. And I thought, you know, it's five years ago, you know, in that classic New Labour phrase, you've got to move on, Alistair, you know. In the very back. Um, hold on, hold on, wait for the mic, please. Hi. Um, you mentioned the, the difference between the sort of investigative uh, muckraking journalism that you do and some of the more sort of anodyne verbatim reporting of uh, some of your colleagues. Do you feel that the investigative stuff is on the wane in this country? And if so, what's to be done? Um, it's never been particularly healthy, I have to say. I mean, um, this, this idea that it was a great golden age of investigative journalism. Um, actually, it, you know, until about the 1960s, really only probably one paper, possibly two papers, did investigative journalism at all, and that was the people and the news of the world. Um, and, and some of their stuff was actually quite good in a limited sort of, I expose the vice dens of Soho sort of way. Um, and then you had the Sunday Times in the 60s, um, uh, and, and again, that, that's, that was pretty good, um, but it wasn't, you know, it didn't last all that long. I mean, investigative journalism has always been quite, quite a tender plant. Um, has it declined? Uh, arguably, I think, I mean, the Nick Davis thesis, the, the uh, journalist Nick Davis has written this book, um, Flat Earth News, uh, 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 which basically the thesis of that is that journalists have to fill more and more space, um, and so they have less and less time to actually do journalism. And, and, uh, and I think I half agree with that. I agree with that for local journalism. I think what's happened is, is in local journalism has been this terrible atrophying uh, huge numbers of, of, of very quite reputable local papers are produced by sort of 22 year olds and 25 grand a year, a handful of people like that who are, who are um, just run off their feet and haven't even got time to make phone calls on some stories. I'm not so sure it's happening at, at national level. I think some of the national papers have done some quite good stuff. Um, but I do think it's rare and it's rarer than it should be. Yeah, in the very back. Thank you. Do you think the Rothermere Press would ever let you be um, anti-Ken, so pro-Ken? Well, um, I think they would actually. I mean, um, you see, the thing is, people have got this idea about the Evening Standard. I mean, it, we don't start, we don't start every day in a bunker with Veronica Wadley, the editor, stri stroking a white cat and saying, you know, today you will destroy Ken Livingstone. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. I promise. She is, she is the, she is. She, nobody, she, nobody has ever told me to go for Ken. Um, uh, it's, uh, I, as a, I, I use the, um, I, I may have said this already, I can't remember, but I, I, use, I use a quote that Neil Kinnock gave about um, Ken Livingstone, um, which is that everyone loves Ken except the people who know him. 
And the reason the Evening Standard is so hostile to Ken is that it knows him. Um, <coughs> unlike any national paper, it actually has to deal with a man day in, day out, um, and, 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 and you know all the lies, all the, all the hysteria, all the throwing his toys out of the paper, and he does with us. Um, and no, no other national paper has that. Uh, until, I until I went to work on the Evening Standard, I did have a vaguely positive feeling towards Ken, like quite a lot of people. I thought, you know, he's done some good things, congestion charge, blah de blah blah But then I, then I got to know him. Um, and I challenge anyone who knows Ken, apart from his very closest cronies, not to, not, not to take the attitude that, that I'd taken. So it's not a kind of policy. I, would, if, if I wanted to be, if I wanted to be pro-Ken, I could be. Um, I, c I can write what I want in my columns. Um, there's, there's, there's the old, the, the, old, the, old, the old way it works. I mean, nobody ever tells you to do stuff, but uh, you, do, you do get the, um, obviously, you, you do catch a sniff of the prevailing wind. And it's certainly true um, that, that, you know, loads and loads of pro-Ken stories would not make it into the paper in the same way that, 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 um, that anti-Ken stories have. But that is because, it's not because the standard's got any kind of ideological hatred of Ken because it's the London branch of the Daily Mail or such like crap. It's not the London branch of the Daily Mail. Um, much more liberal than the male. Um, it's because it knows him. Mm. All right. right over here. Right, a second. Wait, wait for the mic, please. Thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Gordon Adam. I live just north of Inverness. I couldn't care a damn who's the next uh, mayor of <laughs> London. Right. But my, um, my question's a bit different. Um, Andrew, you talked about the trauma of being um, uh, the, at the receiving end of a lot of media attention. I'm just wondering how that whole episode has affected the way that you do your job now, if at all. It's changed it a lot, actually. I mean, on this thing, this is the biggest thing. The Ken, sorry to come back to Ken, um, but this is the biggest thing I've done since since um, Iraq, and 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 I did it very differently. Um, uh, what it taught, what David Kelly taught me was that single anonymous sources, however good they are, and David Kelly was good, are not enough. They can be pressured. They can, uh, you know, um, they're in, in, you know inevitably. So this story was based on um, on documents, on on the record statements um, by by people, um, mostly uh, f a little bit of off the record, but not much. And uh, uh, companies' house records, uh, leaked emails, uh, all that kind of stuff. It all had to be really copper bottom because we knew Ken would massively go for us on this, and uh, and we knew he'd try. We we knew he'd bring up David Kelly, frankly, as he did. And, you know, I mean, I've been accused of uh, I've been accused of being David Kelly's murderer by by Ken, and. Uh, um, uh, as well as all the other delightful charges, and I knew that I knew there'd be all that stuff, so I knew we had to bolt it right down, which we, which we have done, um, uh, and uh, so far they haven't actually been able to uh, to challenge a, a single actual fact that we've that we've written. Mm. Over here, thanks. I'd like to know how you feel about working for Press TV. As it's Iranian state controlled. Yeah, I'm, um, I was a bit, um, I was a bit uh, wary when I got the offer, as you can imagine. There's this this channel, which is a kind of English language version, uh, the Iranians English language TV, and um, I thought, firstly, um, <coughs> do I want to take money from the mullahs? Um, and uh, in the end, I thought, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, but secondly, would it be propaganda? And um, and I said to them, um, I would like uh, guarantees in writing, which I got, that I can have anyone I want. It, w what I do is I host this program called Forum, which is a discussion program. It's a bit like Question Time. I'm the David Dimbleby figure without hair. And um, and, and it's like a balanced panel of, of four people and questions from an audience. It's, very, it's pretty much exactly the same as Question Time, except there's only one subject a week. Um, and um, so I said, I, can have, I, I must be able to have anybody I want, and they must be able to say anything they want. Um, they, are, you know, they, they, you know, they can be critical of Iran, um, they can be, uh, they can be pro-Israeli, that sort of thing. And um, and actually, that's been fine. They've, they've never, they've never. I, I have had whoever I want. We've had people who've been extremely critical of Iran on the program. I have myself, and um, and also people who have who've, who've, who've crossed a lot of the regime's red lines. Um, so, so I'm I'm happy that the program I do, at least on Press TV, is is um, is you know editorially as strong as it could be. It's not propaganda. Over there. Can I just go back to your um, relationship with the BBC and, and ask a question about BBC journalism, which is um, 
Um, when the whole David Kelly thing blew up, um, and I, I was writing a couple of pieces for The Observer at the time, and I spoke to a few BBC journalists um, of the kind that you would, I think, respect, not the ultra-cautious reporter kind, um, who said, this is exactly the kind of thing that we ought to be doing, but Andrew's possibly the wrong person that we should be going to the wall for. And their concern was that your brand of investigative journalism was perhaps a little bit too cavalier, um, and you talked about single source and single anonymous sources uh, for the BBC. Not because the BBC is cowed or state run or anything like that, but simply because it owes a journalistic responsibility that no other organisation does. The mistake that you made, which you've acknowledged, wouldn't have mattered on ITN or Sky or any of the newspapers, but the BBC is, has to be beyond White Caesar's wife, beyond suspicion. So is there a sense that maybe you were, or your brand of reporting was an accident waiting to happen, and that those kind of one or two small mistakes were inevitably, given the prices that was at stake, at some stage going to be blown up and become a huge confrontation? I think it's hard to see how um, that kind of thing could inevitably have led to somebody's death and, and the resignation of the Director General of the BBC. Um, uh, and I, I do say, obviously, as I've said before, I, I acknowledge I made a mistake in that first two-way. But I don't think it was symptomatic of a, of a generally cavalier approach. Um, I'd done a lot of stories um, uh, which had got a, a great deal of coverage inside and, and outside the BBC. Um, and on the question of single sourcing, um, again, I, I, I need to come back to this point because it's very important. Um, the decision to go ahead with a story based on a single source was not my decision. It was the decision of my editor. Um, I, I said to him, look, this is, this, is, this is what I've got. This is all I've got. Is it enough to go, to go on air with? And he said, yes, let's do it. Um, so that was his decision. My responsibility was to come, was to bring in what I'd got. His responsibility was to say, uh, either, no, I don't think you've got enough here, I don't think it meets the standards of the BBC, or yes, it does, let's go with it. And that was what he decided. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, um, I'm not, by the way, trying to duck out of blame for what happened. As I say, I do accept it, but um, it was, you know, broadcasting is a collaborative process, and, and uh, responsibility for these kind of things has to be shared. And unfortunately, in the end, it all ended up getting dumped on me. <coughs> Down here in the front. Hi, my name is Fatima Isawi. I used to work with uh, BBC Arabic right. uh, service, and uh, I used to work within this mentality that every decision uh, has to be made by the editor. So we bring the material, but they have yeah. to take the decision. And uh, journalists are not really totally journalists because they don't have the freedom of really taking journalist um, decisions. And maybe you feel yourself that you was uh, a kind of victim of the system that uh, well, they have to take the decision, but finally they talked about you, that you are the responsible of well, this decision. I, 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 am, I am the person whose voice you hear, you see, which is why it all came on me. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't appeal for sympathy for myself. I, ne I never did and never have. I mean, uh, uh, as I say, I was partly responsible. But, um, uh, but, but I do think one of the things it... it, uh, it uh, it did show up was the serious weaknesses in the management of the BBC at all levels, um, from the governors right on down. And actually, those were the, um, you know, I, I think they had, dare I say, the greatest share of the blame for, for what happened. Uh, in, well, the government had the greatest share, but in, 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 with, within the BBC, the government, the, the managers had um, a, a considerable share of the blame. I mean, the trouble was, I know that had this occurred on a newspaper, let, let us say that a newspaper. That, that this had happened on a newspaper for a moment. Well, uh, a, a newspaper, there are basically two, possibly three at most layers of management. Um, and really, there's only one. There's the editor and the reporter. Whenever I got a complaint on, my, uh, uh, on the Sunday Telegraph or indeed on the Evening Standard, what happens is that uh, there is a person who specifically deals with all complaints, the managing editor. Um, and he approaches me directly and says, look, we've got this. What do you think? What do you say? Um, and then you know, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, and, and, that's, that's, and, and they handle it, in, possibly in consultation with the edge of the paper. Whereas at the BBC, 
The response to this complaint was ludicrous. I didn't even know, I actually didn't even know that Downing Street had made that initial complaint I mentioned um, right after the broadcast until almost three weeks afterwards. I didn't even know they'd complained. Um, I, uh, I, I never saw the letters they sent. Uh, I never had any involvement in drafting the replies. Um, people, uh, Richard Sandbrook, um, went on the BBC, on, on the Today programme, um, the, the head of news went on the Today programme and said something which he should never have said, and, 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 and you know, an honest mistake. He said that the David Kelly was an intelligence source, and actually I'd never called him that. Um, I'd called him uh, a source involved in the preparation of the dossier. He was not a member of the intelligence services, and that was used against us. Um, it, was, it was a mess. The, the way they responded was a mess. There were, there were, there were, the response was, desired, was decided in huge meetings with six or seven people, and often they're never quite the same six or seven people in the room, um, and often not the actual reporter who'd actually spoken to the source and done the story. And, uh, and so the way they responded was a mess, and, and, uh, um, and, and, and that is part of the reason why the BBC got into such trouble. Um, arguably what they should have done when Campbell issued his day march at the Select Committee on the 25th of June would, was to was, was not to rush into a response and to say, well, look, we're going to think about this. We'll give you. We'll come back to you in a couple of days. But they got. They panicked uh, again, and they and they uh, and they rushed into a response perhaps too quickly. But um, but uh, you know, broadly, I mean, let, let's not forget here. Broadly, the BBC was right. The story was right. Um, they were right to defend it. Um, it was just the way they defended it could have been a bit better. Yeah, can be here. I'm interested to know whether you think um, changes have occurred over the last 10 to 15 years which have actually rendered journalists more exposed to sometimes very craven, even irresponsible um, exposure. In other words, they've been put into a position where they are more personally responsible than before, whereas in the past organizations would be, I think, rather braver in standing up for de defending their protege, if you like. And I mean, specifically speaking, you're getting laws of commercial confidentiality now, which are yeah. draconian. Um, businesses are almost impossible to penetrate. It's extremely difficult to get information. I mean, I made documentaries for 40 years or so, well, nearly 40 years, and so I can recall earlier times when the telephone was an instrument which, was, which you could actually use. Now people hide behind their emails, and if they don't like the look of you, Usually they don't, they're not going to answer. Um, and, and I recall, um, I worked for eight years, the last eight years of my professional life was at Channel 4, a searing experience. Um, and the crowning moment of this, I remember, was when um, it, it was made publicly known to people working in documentaries that under no circumstances in any way at all was anything to be done which might entail the slightest likelihood of a legal action. Now, the thing about it is, it seems to me that that's a, that's a surrender document. That's Channel 4. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Basically, what you're saying yeah. is you're, you've now got to be so cautious that um, unless you are 150% right about everything, which is impossible, we're not going to print it. Yeah, I mean, I, I must admit, that hasn't been my experience of Channel 4. They're quite feisty, and I've, I've made loads of documentaries. I, you know, one of my hats is a reporter on dispatches, which is their documentary stand. And, and they, they, they've been pretty feisty. Um, what about the North? But I mean, the, one of the problems at the BBC was that, yeah, they, they were terribly cautious about libel, um, and, uh, and quite a lot of libel lawyers knew that if they simply threatened the BBC with a libel case, they'd settle. Um, and obviously, that was terrible. I mean, uh, there was some case I can't remember what it was, um, where they actually did settle, and, and the person, the reporter concerned, was totally outraged. Um, uh, I think there is there is that, and I think also, also what you have the growth of live broadcasting. I mean. That was one of the things that got me into trouble. It was live, um, and uh, there's this cult of the two-way um, in in, uh, in broadcasting now. It's it's awful. It's moronic. I think I'd much rather do a built package, um, uh, uh, but you know you always have to go live because you have to, you know, you have to sort of show you're there and you're you know it's got to be immediate. Um, but I, I do think I mean o often it is simply moronic. You, you know you you're there on the ten you're watching the ten o'clock news and you've got. To, story about the child support agency and you cut to some shivering reporter standing outside darkened office building and saying well actually they all went home five hours ago you know and what can you tell me from outside the headquarters of the child support agency that you couldn't tell me at five o'clock um, and um, and and uh, 
and and that's that's awful. And as I said, I mentioned the kind of cult of the two-way and how it imprisoned us on our roof in Baghdad. And um, uh, and you know, there's a famous story about Peter Arnett, who was the CNN correspondent in the first Gulf War, and then went to Bosnia after, and um, and and was you know trapped in his hotel not by the siege or anything, but by the demands of Atlanta for endless two-ways. And, um, and, and he would say, uh, you know, guys, I'm a reporter, I want to report, you know, you, I've, you know, got to let me out there. And, and some CNN producer said, well, sure, Peter, but, you know, just be back in 14 minutes. <laughs> and, you know, and it's, that's, that's how bad it's got. Uh, so, you know, um, um, so there's that. And that's, as well as being journalistically confining, it, it's, um, it, it does, it's inevitably more error-prone because you're, you know, you're lying. Andrew, Phil Harding, um, I was an editor at the BBC, although I have no you idea which of the, the Today categories program. I was editor of the Today programme. I have no idea which of those categories I would fit into. <laughs> um, you were described at the inquiry, uh, I think I've got the quote right, as being a, a reporter who painted in primary colours. Um, is that a description of yourself that you would recognise? Well, uh, I didn't particularly object to that description. I mean, I didn't think it was entirely true. Um, but, at, you know, the job of journalism is to communicate. The job of journalism is to, is to, is to describe... It, I mean, if, if you had to describe a story in the average, you know, two, two and a half minutes that a package on the Today programme allows, um, then, you, you know, you, you, couldn't be, um, you couldn't be too nuanced because you otherwise... You, you, you'd risk not being able to tell the story, um, and uh, um, uh, and I, I think what the comment meant. It was originally made by Frank Gardner, actually, and it was then picked up by by Richard Sandbrook. Um, uh, um, and I do remember, I do remember feeling surprised that Frank Gardner was able to make that comment because I remember seeing lots of terribly alarming pieces from Frank Gardner saying we're all going to die in an explosion at one point, um, and you know, Al Qaeda is coming to get us, and that was that was a primary colour brighter than any I could paint it. Um, but um, um, I, I think it was partly justified, and, and, and I, w I wouldn't mind the description. But, but if it meant that I said something that wasn't true or wasn't fair, then, then I'd, I'd reject that. So is being nearly right good enough? Or, well, you know what? or, does, it, or does it actually matter to be 100% right? Well, and should the BBC have a different, a yeah. different, should the BBC have a different standard from other media? It does have a different standard from other media. There's no doubt about that. And, and, um, and when I was there, I observed that standard. Um, but, uh, but this idea that, um, that, that, you know, I mean, I think Richard said this after, and he said something like, you can't be... Um, 90, you know, it's 90 percent right, but you can't be 90 percent pregnant. Um, and I think that's a wrong analogy to make. Um, the fact is, as I said, um, journalism is a um, necessarily and inevitably a um, a, a rough draft, um, as, as the editor of the Washington Post, Ben Bradley, described it. Not not a paper you'd um, you, you'd, you'd necessarily put down there with the with the with the unreliables. Um, and you, you must try your absolute best to get it 100% right. But, but you can't be held back um, by the faintest possibility that it might not be 100% right. This is not a legal thesis we're doing it. This is one of the things that Hutton misunderstood. It's a piece of, journalism is not the same as, as, as the law, where you get, you, know, you get everyone in a room and you have a stenographer and then they all draw up written statements. Journalism is a messy business. Uh, and it's not actually, there there's, isn't always one clear version. Um, and, and what you've got to try and do is communicate, arguably, that greyness um, sometimes, if that happens to be the truth. But, but you know, it, it, journalism, news and, and human events don't come in, in, in easily digestible pieces and bite-sized pieces all the time. And there is inevitably going to be some error. The, the, um, the, the, the key for me is trying to, be as, trying to be as accurate as you possibly can be um, and uh, correcting errors when you make them, um, and, uh, uh, and, um, and and you know being absolutely honest and fair and truthful in everything you do. Um, uh, but the demand that that everything you say should always have to be 100 percent right is is you know would basically kill all journalism, including vast amounts of the BBC's. Vast amounts of the things that the BBC <coughs> said are not 100 percent right. I think that's particularly true in the basis of Nick Davies' book, where 75 percent of all the print in, 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 it comes out of wire services where nothing's ever checked. Yeah, I mean, there is an allegation in Nick Davies' book, which I know the BBC disputes, that they, um, 
they, they've been that journalists at News 24 have been told to get things on on, mm. on air in two minutes or something. There isn't time to check anything in two minutes. And uh, um, uh, and honestly, I mean, the BBC, God knows, I mean, the BBC got huge numbers of things wrong over Iraq. And actually, my story was was one of the by far one of the m most accurate things done about about the government's case for war in Iraq. Um, we. There are there are errors. There are a certain amount of errors that are really are allowed on the BBC, which are basically lies told by government ministers. Um, and uh, if you know far more of, I mean, far more of, um, far more of what I reported, people like Colin Powell and Jack Straw saying was wrong than what I actually got for myself. But of course, nobody ever gets into trouble for that. Um, uh, you know, that, that was actually that was my that's my main that that's my main commission com confession of failure. To be honest, in the run up to the war, you know. Okay, we did all right after. In the end, it was, you know, actually, it was journalism of all the estates, all, all the estates of the realm, apart from the fourth estate, failed. I mean, Parliament, in the person of the Foreign Affairs Committee, was more interested in hounding David Kelly than getting to the truth of the dossier. The civil service, in the person of John Scarlett, became Campbell's accomplice. The judiciary, of course, in the person of Lord Hutton, you know, failed. But but actually, journalism did not fail to get to the truth afterwards. However, my criticism is that it should have got to the truth before. Um, it should have been a bit more questioning before, and that was where I failed. I did an awful lot of stuff on today, um, quoting people like Colin Powell and Jack Straw, who were fully wrong. Um, and, well, you know, it, it not not well, a hundred percent wrong. Um, anyway, a lot more wrong than anything I did. Um, ori any original journalism I did, let's put it like that. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I've talked everyone into a cone. <laughs> <haven't I? laughs> yeah. Is there anyone else? Well, I think, well then, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure.